All right, thank you guys all for coming today. Um, and uh, Dean Leslie, thank you so much for everything. Uh, we just spent probably a half an hour, 45 minutes together before this, and I heard all the amazing things that Dean Leslie and Cardozo is doing right now, um, and it really is exciting. And I like that it's so modern and forward thinking. So I think you guys are all incredibly fortunate to be here to, to experience that um, and to help with that. Um, and Pat, thank you very much. And Val, I also heard about the amazing things that you're doing. So thank you. Um, so this talk um, it came out of actually when I was uh, the alum of the year. I had had lunch uh, with Pat Weiss and the former dean of Cardozo. Um, and they had asked me at lunch to tell them about my background. They knew me, you know, kind of just knowing me, but they didn't know my background. And so I launched into a little bit of here's where I came from, here's you know, how I got to where I am. And I can't remember if it was you, Pat, or the dean, but one of them said, you have to tell this story. And it wasn't because I kind of went on this you know, path that people might have expected of always doing well, um, going to you know, the best schools, getting the best grades, because I didn't get the best grades. I didn't always do well. I didn't always have a lot of ambition. In fact, my biggest ambition was probably to sit on a couch and watch TV, which I still like to do, but I like to do other things also. Um, but rather than going into that, which I was going to, I want to mention something that happened just downstairs. I was getting coffee um, on the third floor, I guess on upstairs on the third floor. And somebody walked up to me, um, and I won't name names or say give specifics just to, for his own uh, privacy, but he walked up and he said, uh, Mr. Hennis, I want to thank you. And I turned and looked. I said, please don't call me Mr. Hennis because I, I don't like when people call me Mr. Hennis. They call me John. And he said, um, he said, you know, I saw your talk last year. And he said, I didn't do well my first year in law school. I started doing a little bit better. I wasn't really sure what to do. I was kind of thinking about giving up. But then I saw your talk and I decided not to give up. And I got a internship at a, a very good business and now I'm going to be doing that when I graduate and I thought that that was great it made me feel good because I could just stand up here and talk for a little while and it doesn't mean anything but I hope that what I have to say will you know help at least one of you if not all of you in one way or another all right so uh, Dean Leslie kind of went through all of this different stuff that I do and you put on your bio and just remember it's all marketing right so you shouldn't believe it all um, <laughs> But um, I do have, I do lead a pretty busy life between, um, between family, between work, between charities, between just trying to enjoy myself and, and do different things. And I think that that's important, um, you know, to make sure that you have a varied life. And for me, I, I like to juggle. If I get to a point where I don't have a lot to do, I get bored. It's like, you know, when, when kids are idle, they get into trouble. It's kind of like me. So I like to just make sure that I'm doing a lot of different things. All right. So let's talk a little bit about where I came from. Um, so I grew up in, in a suburb of New York City in Westchester County, a small town. My parents um, both went to Cornell. Uh, my father was a veterinarian. My mother was a financial planner. Um, so I basically you know, came from a family that, uh, that, that um, was very well educated um, and had the means to you know, put me in good positions and I took no advantage of that whatsoever. Um, what I did do is I played sports when I was in growing up and I was pretty good at it. Um, and so that was completely what defined me when I was growing up. I was an athlete. I grew up in a small town like I said so when I would walk down the street and there was a game that night no matter which sport it was People would literally come out of you know the bars or the the delis and say you know all right John come on today you're going to do it right I mean so to me it was all about sports um, and when I wasn't playing sports or hanging out with friends um, I really didn't know what I wanted to do school was not something that was important to me one of the things I got through sports and I didn't know that this would be important to me later in life and I don't think I really understood the importance of it when it was happening. But I had one coach, uh, Bill Tom, who actually ended up coaching basketball for about 30-something years at, at my high school, Croton Harmon High School, and is just retiring this year. Um, but he made a big difference because he came in and he said, number one, when we go out to, um, to uh, an away game, everybody's got to wear a jacket and tie. 
right? We show respect, we're from Croton, we're gonna show respect to everybody. Second, he said, we're going to give back. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about giving back later because I, I don't love that term and I'll explain. Um, but he, so we volunteered at the Special Olympics, we volunteered at the VA hospital, which by the way are two totally different experiences because at the Special Olympics you have all of these kids, right, that are out there um, uh, comp uh, competing with each other, um, clearly not born with the same, you know, um, I'll call them abilities, although I don't think that's fair, but out there trying so hard and working. So we were out there with these kids, you know, helping them along. And then you go to the VA hospital with our veterans, which I don't even think at the time I understood what it meant for somebody to be a veteran. Um, so older people who you know, had real mental issues and it was actually a little bit scary walking in there. And so when we did this, my friends and I with our coach, we knew we were doing something good, but I don't think I fully got it. Looking back now, I totally get it and I'm gonna get into that later. All right, so here I am, I'm playing sports. I've got a coach that forces me to go do good things, which is good. Um, and now it's time to um, get ready for college, so I've got to take the SATs. Um, and, and I know it's different for you guys now. Like, the SAT scores are different. I think there's, it's like 2,400 instead of 1,600 or whatever it is. But for me, when I took it, you only took the SATs. You didn't take the ACTs. And it was out of 1,600 math and verbal. Um, and on my verbal, and I took it twice, by the way, um, and took a course after the first time because my verbal score was so bad, and I got the same, like I said, the same verbal score twice, which is a 470 in verbal, okay? And if you put that in perspective, the year I took it, the average SAT verbal was, in New York State, was 501, and in the US it was 507, so I got significantly below the average. Um, and remember, I'm a lawyer today, so I like write and everything, but at that time, I was illiterate. I mean, literally illiterate, and couldn't even take, you know, my parents paid for this course to get me to do better and still couldn't do it. Um, so I play sports, my grades aren't so good, I've got a 470 in verbal. Okay, so now here's another lesson that I learned, but at the time I didn't really know what it meant. Looking back, I fully get it. Um, there's a movie called Clueless, which you guys all may be too young to have ever seen. If you haven't seen it, you should see it. It's a really, really good movie. But there's um, one scene where Cher, who's the protagonist in the movie, she's a, maybe a senior in high school, uh, she goes into her father's home office, and he's a corporate lawyer, litigator, and, and I have it up here, but she says, he says, he, she tells him that she got her grade changed from a C minus, or a C plus to an A minus. And he says to her, you mean to tell me that you argued, you argued your way from a C plus to an A minus? And she basically says, yes, I did, based on my powers of persuasion. And he says, that I, you know, I almost couldn't be happier than if those were based on real grades, okay? Well, I had my own experience like that. So my parents, you know, I, they were, I would drive them crazy because I didn't do well. And they always said, you have potential, you're smart, you should be able to do well. Um, so they tried everything. They threatened me, you know, you're gonna go to military school. Um, they tried everything, it didn't work. They weren't really gonna send me to military school though, so I always knew that was an idle threat. Um, but so they finally said, maybe we can find a way to incentivize John. So they said, you know what, you're, you're gonna get your license soon. If you make honor roll, we'll get you a car, okay? Which by the way, now as a parent, I'm not sure I would parent that way, but <laughs> it, it benefited me. Um, and in order to get, to make honor roll at my high school, you had to have an 85 average or above and no grade below an 80. And so I worked as hard as I had ever worked to try to get that. And when I got my report card back, I had an 85.25 and I had a 79. And the 79 was in typing. And so I sat there and I looked at it and I was like, I can't believe one point is gonna mean that I don't get a car and in typing, right, like that. So what did I do? I walked out of the typing teacher, okay? And I always got along with my teachers and I was always nice and respectful. And I walked in and I said to her, um, I said, you know, I need your help here. And she said, what can I help you with? And I said, well, I get a car if I make honor roll, but you gave me a 79, so now I can't make honor roll, so I need you to give me an 80. And she said, well, but I gave you a 79. And I said, right, but I'm, I'm always nice in class. People in typing are always you know, causing trouble. I never cause trouble. And she said, well, that's true, but I still gave you a 79. And I said, but you know, I play football. I hurt my hand. I've got fat fingers. It's hard for me to type, like all of these different things. And she kept saying, but I gave you a 79. And then I finally said, look, I said, here's the thing. Let's look big picture. 
I said, let's say it's raining out one day and you're standing on the corner and you, all you want to do is get out from the rain and get home. If you give me an 80, I may drive by and pick you up. If you don't, I can. And so she actually, and I'm not kidding, she actually finally, I think just because she knew I wasn't leaving until she changed her mind, she went down and had the grade changed and so I made honor roll and got my car. But it's a good lesson of that anything can be changed, right? You just gotta look at the big picture, be nice, be polite, talk to people, and you can sometimes make things change. Um, I'm gonna talk about this one again in a second, but in the past, just to, I'm actually, I'm gonna skip by in the past because we're gonna get to it later, but remember it because it's, it goes to my illiter Ill illiteracy. Um, but the, the basic um, takeaway from this slide and from at least my high school life is um, it's never too late to develop yourself, right? Never sit there and say, just because you think you're not good at something now doesn't mean you can't be good at it later. Um, and just because you might look at the world differently than other people do doesn't mean you're looking at it wrong. Um, so you're not carved in stone. It's never too late to develop yourself. And at least with respect to me, I'll show you that that's true. Okay, so there's many paths to take. Choose your own. So what does this mean? So now here I am defined by sports, and um, I go to Union College. And the only reason I got into Union College, because again, you know, with a 470 on your verbal, you don't get into a lot of schools, um, and my grades were just average, um, but I played sports. And with football, they recruited me and wanted me to go play there. So that's what I was going to do, and I knew what that meant. I knew what it was to be good at football and to play football. Um, but what I didn't know was how to deal with you know, an injury that made me not be able to play sports anymore. Right? So I hurt my knee in college and that ended sports for me, at least competitive sports. Um, I still play sports, I can still run and walk and stuff, I'm okay, but I couldn't play football at college anymore. So I had no idea what to do. I literally um, felt like you, know, you kind of, at least for my life again, because it's defined by sports, I was always moving up and then I get to college and when I couldn't play, I just dropped, right? And I was like down at the bottom looking up, trying to figure out who am I, what do I do? So I just started to try things, right? So um, I, and th this, is, this is like sophomore, junior year at this point. So I um, DJed with a couple of my friends. We had a radio station on campus and we did this like rap morning DJ show. Um, and again, these are gonna be like, you know, Tribe Called Quest and Public Enemy and people that you may not have ever heard of, maybe you have. Um, but we would go and, you know, three, you know, Jewish guys doing the rap show at seven o'clock in the morning. And we had a lot of fun and we were doing that. I, um, I sang in a band, okay? And so something I never would have thought that I would have tried to do. And it, it all came out of a drunken night, but I was at a fraternity party and a friend of mine was in a band and when they took a break, I went up and there's a song called Johnny Be Good and I said, hey, I can sing that song. And they said, all right, get up and sing it. And then I sang it and I woke up the next morning and they said, we're getting rid of our singer, will you be our singer? And I'm not even a good singer, so that just shows how bad he was. Um, but I did that for a while. My problem with that was I could not, um, I wasn't secure enough, at least at the time, to be able to get up and sing unless I had some drinks in me. And then they would have these like battles of the band during like the day, and which not, I mean, you're in college, you can drink you know, at eight o'clock in the morning and get ready for it, but it ended up fizzling out. Um, then I also, I tried to play, okay, which again, something that, it, well, I'll take it back. When I was in high school, all of my friends, they would put on these like plays at school and my friends would do them and I never would do them. And I kind of sit there and regret it and say, yeah, I should, but for whatever reason, insecurities, I just wouldn't do it. So I tried one, realized it wasn't for me, but uh, you know, something else that I tried. Then I joined a fraternity. Um, my freshman year when I got to school, um, I, my roommates all were gonna join one fraternity, which I, so I kind of met everybody there, but it wasn't my type of people. And then I played, was playing football, so the football fraternity wanted me to join. Um, but I kind of got to the point with my knee injuries and stuff where I was like, I'm just, I'm not doing this. So I waited until my junior year, which at least at Union, and I think most schools, is, a, is late to be joining a fraternity, but I did, and it was a good experience. I mean, I got, it, I, that's where all my friends were, so I decided to do it. I mean, it was a little tough being, you know, um, going through pledging with like your best friend telling you all these things to do. Um, so I didn't always listen, but it, it all worked out. 
And then I wrote for the college paper a little bit. And again, so despite being illiterate, I decided I could write. Um, and one of the things that I would always do is, um, and I see this with my son now, but I would take very strong positions on things, maybe not always thinking them out that well. So I did get called into the dean's office at the college for something that I wrote once um, about accusing the college of, of having a blind eye to drugs or something. I don't know what I wrote. Everybody was angry with me. It was a, a very difficult period of time. Um, so the question was, what did I want? And I had no idea what I wanted. Right? So I was just in college trying things, flailing around, you know, enjoying myself to some extent, but really having no idea what I wanted to do. So now, here we go, and we pull up, we get up to senior year. So what do you do senior year? You look for a job. Except I didn't know what I wanted to do, so why should I look for a job? Just because I'm going to graduate, you know, that shouldn't mean anything. So all of my friends are looking for jobs or applying to, you know, go work on Wall Street or for an accounting firm, or they're applying to go to law school or business school. Um, and I really, I'm not kidding, was looking around for people to play beer pong with. That was my kind of looking for a job. And so when I graduated, I had no job. And so for the first summer, I basically hung out with my friends and laid on my parents' couch in their family room and watched TV. Um, that's what I did. At some point, my parents were like, you, you probably got to get some kind of job so you can at least contribute a little bit. So I did. So I went to four years of college. Um, I was fortunate enough for my parents to pay for that. And my first job was I walked into the local mall and applied at the Gap to become a stock boy. Um, so right after college, I was in the back of the Gap folding clothes, which, by the way, is also something I found out I'm not good at um, and don't want to be good at. There's certain things that you're not good at that you want to try and you want to say, OK, that's something I really want to do. Folding clothes to this day, I don't care. I can just throw them in the corner. Um, but so I was a stock boy at the Gap. Um, not real challenging, not, you know, probably not what my parents were really excited about, making this investment in my education so I could go do that. Um, and then my mom came up to me one day and she said, I met this guy who got together with some Israeli guys and they started this um, TV station in New York. Um, and they're looking for somebody to be a segment producer. She goes, I don't even know what that is, but it's some talk show. Do you want to talk to them? And I had always had an interest in TV, and I'll explain that also in a second in why. Um, and so I met with the guy, one of the guys who started, and he said, listen, we, we started this talk show. It's an awesome name, Schmoozing, okay? And it's going to be a, um, it's a Jewish talk show. We're going to talk about Jewish topics. And we're hiring a few people to be segment producers. So your job would be figuring out topics, figuring out who the guests would be, you know, kind of uh, explaining to the hosts what they have to talk about and what questions they should have. And that's what you should do. That's what you would be doing. So I said, great, sign me up. And I remember that job, they paid me $100 a week. Um, so that's really a lot of money. So, but it was an incredible experience um, just through the people that I got to meet, what I got to do. And I found out something else, which is, again, get having people like you and being a good person and being polite and working hard gets you further than anything else because I'm sure you guys are all surprised at this, but schmoozing didn't do so well. Um, <laughs> and so they started firing people. And when like, I was the last man standing, and th so they made me the actual producer of the whole show, which then failed. But um, I don't think it was because of me. But the um, but I but I the only reason I, it wasn't that I was I don't think any more talented than the other people. It's that you know the guy who ran it. We would you know sit down and talk about life and other things, and I would listen to him, and I would you know I would really try to learn from him. Um, I worked hard. I would stay late. You know, I, I never complained. Um, and so I think he was finally like, okay, when I have to get rid of people, who am I going to get rid of? I like everybody, but you know, this guy is a guy that I like to hang out with. I know he's going to be here for me. You know, I know he's going to work hard, so I'll keep him. Okay. So now that ended. So now I had to figure out what to do next. Um, so I went back to my parents' couch, thought about it, and I started to be. I did some substitute teaching at my high school. I started to coach, um, assistant coach basketball, and I was the uh, freshman lacrosse coach. Um, and I started bartending and waitering to make money. Okay, so that was my life. And and by the way, that was going to be my life. I as I sat there and thought about it, I was like, okay, what I'm going to end up doing is I'll be a coach at 
you know, my high school, right? And by the way, which to this day, looking back, it would have been a great thing to do. I would have loved doing that. It was one of my favorite jobs. Um, but it also gave me a lot of time to just sit around, right? And so I would be sitting on that couch uh, or lying on that couch, usually not sitting, and watching TV. And my parents would walk by me and look at me, and I know shake their head, they would be shaking their heads about what is our son doing? He's now 24 years old, lying on a couch, you know, and then sometimes going off to bartend or, you know, coach, but a lot of lying around. So now stop, we'll stop there for one second and we'll, we'll move on with the story. But one of the things that I also learned, and I don't know if I knew it then, but looking back is we all are who we are, right? And so for me, who was I? Right? I was somebody that liked people. I liked being around people. It energized me, right? I like, I don't like, I'm not good when I'm just by myself. I like to be out there talking to people. I like to lead, right? So even the, even the things that I wrote in the college newspaper, which other people got upset about, I wasn't afraid to go out there and say those things. Um, and I wasn't afraid to take positions and say, I'll move forward and take my chances on what's going to happen next. So I, and I also did notice that if I did start moving someplace and talking to people, people would follow. Um, I like to talk, as you can tell. Right? I also like broad storylines, right? So what I mean by that is, I don't like to get into the details of things. And even what I do now as being a restructuring lawyer, like I say all the time, like I'm not even a real lawyer, right? Like my job is to negotiate with people and get people together. And if there's something, you know, corporate that has to happen and documents that people need to read, there's other people that can do that. And if people need to get into court and take discovery and do that, other people can do that. I'll just do the, the big picture stuff, right? And if you come to me and you, and I meet you, I may be interested in, you know, about the details of your life, but at the end of the day, I look at people as kind of, you know, it, it, we're gray, we're not black and white, and so I think that, to me, that's an important thing. And I, I was just saying this to, to Dean Leslie, that one of the things that I tell associates all the time is, I don't care if you're right or wrong, I just want you to get to the right answer. And what I mean by that is, so many people will dig into, I believe this, and won't look at the rest of the picture. And my view is, but if you do that, you're never going to get to an end result, right, where you're bringing people together. So figure out the right way to get someplace rather than you just being right. Um, and then this is from an old, one of my other um, talks that I gave here. And it, in some ways, it makes it look like I'm kind of like intellectual because it's like The Great Gatsby, maybe not the best, most intellectual book. Um, but this quote of conduct may be founded on the hard rock or the wet marshes but I'm going to admit something. I don't think I've admitted this before. Excuse me. Um, I didn't get this quote from reading The Great Gatsby because I think to this day I've never actually read The Full Great Gatsby. There's another book right, um, by a guy named Robert B. Parker who happened to have passed away a few years ago. He wrote these books, um, Spencer for Iyer books. They're like detective novels, which are really good, by the way. But he wrote, he wrote this one non-Spencer book, which was kind of a coming-of-age book called Love and Glory which I've read like 10 times. Um, it's a great book if you want to read it. But he has this quote in that book, so that's where I got the quote, not from the actual Great Gatsby. But what I think, what, what this said to me is when you're, li when you're in life, sometimes you've got a foundation under you and you feel really good and really secure, right? And your conduct and who you are will come from that. But there's other times that you're just sinking in the mud, right? And your conduct and, your, and who you are is going to come from that also. So, no matter where you are in life, feeling great or feeling bad, just know that you're learning and growing. And if you keep that in mind, I think it helps you, especially in those tough times, to keep moving forward. All right, so it's always mom, right? So I'm lying on the couch and my mom comes to me and says, basically, like, what are you doing? And put this in context, my mother was my biggest fan. I mean, there was no one who was a bigger fan, I, no matter, whether I was doing, whatever I was doing, I was always right, okay? She might tell me a better way to be right, but you know, I, I was smart, I was good, I was nice, I could do anything that I wanted to do so long as I put my mind to it. Her view was, you're just not putting your mind to it. Um, but she finally got sick and tired of me lying on the couch. My dad had, I think, given up by this time. And so I remember lying there one day and she came over and she was just like, you know what, you gotta get up. You need to do something, right? Um, I mean, I can read the quote, but you, know, you don't have to have a plan. Because what I was saying to her was, how can I get up? I don't know what I want to do. So you're telling me to go do something, but I don't know what it is. And she was like, you don't have to have a plan, right? But just get up and take a step forward. 
just take a step, do something, and you'll find your way. So she said, you're not going to find your way laying here on the couch. So I laid there on the couch, and I thought about that. And, and, and it made some sense to me. And I was like, my mom's asking me to, so I'm going to do it. I just, you know, but I still am trying to figure out what step forward that will be. Oops. Um, OK, so I needed to push, OK? And a couple things came to mind. Right? One was, and now we'll get back to the TV thing, um, my grandfather, and this, this could be a whole talk in and of itself, so I'm only going to give the really truncated version. But when my dad was, uh, was young, my grandparents got divorced. My grandfather went and worked at an advertising agency called Benton and & Bowles and was very successful there. Um, and at that time, the way that TV worked is that companies like Bayer Aspirin, big companies, would produce TV shows and then put them on the networks, right? So they'd pay to put them on the networks, and that was how they advertised, because you know, Bayer Aspirin would have the, you know, the Dean Leslie variety show, right? And they would have that up there, and they would um, do it. What started to happen was, as everything does, things evolve. And so you had um, companies out in Hollywood that said, you know what, we have a better idea. We'll start developing TV shows. We'll sell those to the networks. And then the networks can go out and bring advertisers in. Because as great as Dean Leslie is, her variety show is not going to be as good as some like really cool, hip, exciting, scary, whatever show that's being produced by these Hollywood development companies. So my grandfather left advertising went out to Hollywood, started a company called Lorimar Productions, um, and was the executive producer of Dallas, the Waltons, Falcon Crest, Eight is Enough. I know all like old time shows, but maybe you've heard of them. Um, and really just we, we became like an iconic guy out in Hollywood. And so when I was graduating from college, the one thing that I did do is I sent him a letter. And just, just to put it in perspective, we had no, at that point in time, we had no relationship with him. He came to my bar mitzvah and then somehow disappeared again. And so I hadn't talked to him or heard from him in eight, nine years. But I wrote him a letter and just to show, you know, so here I am kind of this like, when it comes to academics, I'm insecure, I can't really do well, I'm illiterate, I'm not good, this is how I'm feeling about myself. But somewhere in me is that I could do something great. So I write him a letter that says, I'm graduating, I'm thinking of coming out to Hollywood. I'd love to be able to talk to you and get some advice because I want to run a movie studio, right? Because that's what you would want to do if you go out to Hollywood. Forget about like working at a, you know, production company low level. You want to go run a movie studio. And then once a week, habitually, I would call him, um, and his secretary would get on and say, you know, sorry, he's not available. And then one day he picked up the phone, which I was shocked about, and I kind of took a step back and he said, what do you want? And I said, oh, well, I wrote you this letter. He goes, I know you wrote me the letter. What do you want? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I'm you know, thinking of coming out to Hollywood, and I just wanted some advice. He goes, you want some advice? I'll give you some advice. If you want to run a movie stu studio, run a movie studio. Okay? And when I told people about that, everybody to this day still had the same reaction. of, kind of Like, what a jerk. But my view is a little bit different. I was like, OK, he just gave me the best advice I ever got, which was, if you want to do something, just go do it. Right? That's it. Right? Don't, don't worry about what people are telling you. Don't worry if people are saying you can't do it. Right? Val, you're the perfect example of this. Just go do it. Right? So I took that advice. Then I'm still lying on the couch. I'm thinking about that advice. I'm thinking about my mom and my grandma calls. And now, looking back, I'm sure it was orchestrated with my mom, but I didn't know that at the time. So she calls, and she's like, you know, you really should go do something. And I think what you should do is you should go to law school and be a lawyer. I said, why? She said, well, Ever since you were little, you'd always argue with us, right? If we told you to do something and you didn't want to do it, you'd always give us an argument. And you were always persuasive. So why don't you go be a lawyer? And the best thing about being a lawyer is once you have that degree, you'll always have a job because you can always hang a shingle out, which I think when she said that, I didn't know what it meant to hang a shingle out. But, but I, now I kind of get it. You can always have a job. You can always find a client. <laughs> Literally. Um, a few minutes after that, my best friend called. And my best friend from college was at Tulane Law School. And he said, you know, John, i got to tell you something. He said, in class today, I was sitting there thinking how my friend John Hennis would have loved that class today. And I said, why? And he said, we had this big debate. And I could have just imagined you in the middle of it just really enjoying yourself. And he's like, I really think you should think about going to law school. So I took all of that in. And I said, OK. So my mom's telling me to get up and take a step, right? I've got. My grandma and my best friend calling me and telling me to go to law school. 
right? If I want to go do something, my grandfather, right, who may be a jerk, but he told me I can just go do it. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to apply to law school. There was no other thought given to it other than that. I didn't even know what law school really meant. Didn't know what lawyers really did other than what I saw on TV. So I get to law school. Um, and for the first time in my life, I decided I'm going to work hard. Okay? So I'm going to study. Um, and I studied. I, that first year of law school, that first semester, I studied more than I've ever studied in my life. I had no life other than my study group and the people that I was, was um, spending time with in law school. Um, and I worked so, so hard. And we had one, um, we had one midterm, okay? And the midterm was in civil procedure. And I knew everything, literally everything. Everything that, it, it was Professor Beckerman at the time, every single thing that he told us, I knew. And I went in and I took that midterm. And when I walked out, everybody was talking about how hard it was. And I said, hard, that was easy. That was, that was so easy. I knew everything, right? And then we went off to break and we came back. And at the time, you guys probably do tests on computers now. But we had um, little blue books, right, that you wrote in. And so I filled up an entire blue book. We got back. I was excited, right? And I was excited because I, I said to myself, this is the first test I ever really, really studied for. And I think I did well. This is going to be great. And the blue books came out, and I opened it. And there was a red line through everything that I wrote, just a red line, and then a C minus. And I was shocked. I didn't know what to do, right? So totally deflated. And so after class, I went over, and I said to, I went into his office, and I said, I don't understand. I said, I knew everything, right? And I, I told you, I showed you that. And he said, oh, there is no question that you know everything that I taught you. He said, but what you didn't do is answer my questions. He said, you just wrote back to me everything I taught. I had specific questions, and you told me everything about civil procedure. He's like, so when the final comes, why don't you just start answering my questions, and then you can actually do well, right? Which I think was a really good lesson, because in life, again, it doesn't matter what you know. It's how you apply it. And so when you're sitting with, when you're working for a partner, for instance, in a law firm, and that partner says, here's what I need, if you come back with, um, with all of this information for the partner and it's all accurate, correct information but it didn't answer the question that he wants or she wants, that partner's not going to be happy, right? So that was a huge lesson for me. So I was pretty disappointed but I made the decision that I'd worked hard enough already um, that I was going to keep working hard. And I figured I should at least give first year, you know, the best chance that I can give it, okay? And um, one of the things that always in my mind, so I don't know if you guys, anybody in here is a Bruce Springsteen fan, but um, if you listen to Bruce Springsteen's lyrics, he, he has a lyric that'll teach you about everything in life. And so in this, it's, you know, this, which comes from Badlands, which is one of the great songs ever, um, you know, working in the field till you get your back burned, working beneath the wheels till you get your facts learned. And that's what life's about. So when I was in law school, that's what it was. I was working hard, right, really hard. Um, but I also needed to learn, right? So I was learning how do I actually take a test? Because what I found out was I was actually pretty smart. I actually could learn things and I wasn't totally illiterate, but um, I didn't know how to take a test. So I had to teach myself how to do that. So what I did that first year for second semester is I got all the practice tests from all the professors. Um, I took them all. You know, I remember, I mean, maybe this makes me geeky, but I remember in, uh, in property, um, Professor Sturk, uh, he had, um, he put like five practice tests aside. And my study group and I, we did all five of them and what we realized was he had like 20 issues embedded in, the, in those tests. And so, and, and every one of them, he had the same issue just in a different fact pattern. And so we ended up writing down the 20 issues and when I took the test, my final, I knew that I had to hit each one of those issues and it was going to be somewhere in that test, right? So I learned how to take these tests and I ended up doing well um, and getting on to law review. Um, once I was on law review, um, and this is another good lesson, so now you have to write a note, okay? And, and I know I keep saying illiterate and I'm kind of joking, but I'm kind of not. I really, and even to this day, actually right now I would say I'm, I'm a very good writer. Um, but if you asked me any rule of grammar, I could not give it to you. There's not a chance. You asked me what an adverb is, I do not know. Um, I probably should learn it at some point, but I, but I, I can now write it in the correct 
grammatically correct way. But so I wrote my note, and I worked so hard. Again, this is almost like the civil procedure story. I worked so hard on my note and handed it in. And the editor-in-chief at the time said, he called me, called me up, and he was like, you know, can you come see me? And I, I really thought I was walking in for him to be like, this is the greatest note I've ever seen in my life. And when I sat down with him, he said, you know, you got to take this stuff seriously, right? I mean, like, did you even, like, edit this or look at this or proofread this? And I was like, yeah, I, I, yes, I worked on this nonstop. He goes, if you really did work on this nonstop, you're the worst writer I've ever seen, okay? <laughs> so anyway, I sat down and worked with my editor um, and ended up publishing my note, right? So again, it was... You know, just because the first time you try something you don't do well, if you dig in, if you have grit, if you keep going, if you, you teach yourself, if you learn and you don't give up, you really can make anything happen. Um, then interviewing, because this is another, I think, good lesson. Um, and everybody's going to have their own way. When, when I was interviewing for jobs, what I did was I practiced. I, and I do this, I did this for today too. I practiced nonstop. And what I practiced was, what is the questions that they're going to ask me, and how am I going to answer them? And I have a, um, it's not even a habit, it's just what I do. Uh, when I'm, if I'm getting ready to make an argument in court the next day, if I'm going to get up here and speak to you guys, if I'm going to interview, the way that I get myself ready is I talk to myself. So half the time, if you see me walking down the street and I've got the earpiece in and I'm talking, I'm actually not talking to anybody but myself. Just be, So I know that could seem a little weird, but it would be more weird if I didn't have the earpiece in. Um, but that's how I practice. So I would sit there and, and just over and over again walk around my, my kitchen and, and say my answers for interviews. And so by the time I got into these interviews, any questions they asked, I had my answer, and it was, it was crisp, and it was good, and it made sense. And I literally got to the point where I could be thinking about something else and still have my interview, right? Where I would hear myself talking, but then have to bring myself back to realize that I actually have to focus now because even though my answer is coming out, I'm thinking about something else. But I think you have to find your own way to practice. Um, everybody's got their own way, but it's so important to get yourself ready for things, and everybody does it. Like, the, the people that do the best at anything in their lives, whether it's sports or being lawyers or bankers or anything, you practice, 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 um, and you find your own way to do that. Okay, last thing from, from Cardozo. I wrote there will only be a few, and what I mean by that is, at least in my life, there will only be a few people in life that truly will look out for you without you asking them to. Um, and I was fortunate enough that Dean, at the time when I was in school, was Dean Macchiarola, um, who also unfortunately passed away relatively recently, a few years ago. But he did that for me. I don't know why he did that for me, but he did. He was there for me. He taught me, right? He helped me. He helped me be a better person. He helped me be a better professional. Um, he was just always there for me. He looked out for me. And to this day, I, I, like I said, I don't know 100% why, but I do know that it made so much of a difference in my life. So when you find those people, embrace them. Right? Because if somebody really sees something in you that maybe you don't even see, and they're willing to take the time on their own to give back to you right, and to help you, take advantage of that. They want to do it, right? and it'll help you. And then you'll be able to look back on that and remember. And, and there's only going to be a few of those people. All right, so it's all about when you peak. It's one of my favorite stories. So I'm a summer associate now, right? So I. I get a job as a summer associate at Wild Gottschall, uh, which for you, if you don't know, big law firm. Um, and my best friend in the summer program was, a, was this guy, Mark. And we had a summer associate event, right? So when you're a summer associate, I always say it's like the best job you could ever have because um, you don't really work that much. And they, you make a lot of money. And they, the firms take you out and introduce you to all these things, whether it's great restaurants or activities or whatever. I mean, it's really, it, it makes no sense at the end of the day, but it's the way that it is. And we had, had just had an event. And um, we were sitting at a bar together talking. And he, like, kind of stopped talking. And he looked a little bit down. And I said, what's going on? And he's like, I just got depressed. And I said, why did you get depressed? And he said, well, I was thinking about it. He's like... You know, when I went to, when I was in high school, he said, I worked so hard in high school, right? He's like, I cared so much about my grades. 
right? I got straight A's. He said, I got a, I actually think he got a 1600 on his SATs. Um, he's like, you, he's like, you played football, right? And other sports. He said, you had fun with your friends, right? You went out with girls. He's like, I didn't do any of that. I, he said, and you got, you couldn't even get a B and you had an 1130 on your SATs, right? And a 470 on your verbal, like, I mean, that's, right? So like, that upsets me. He said, then you went to Union, which is a fine school, but you only got in because of football. He's like, I went to Harvard, okay? Then at Harvard, he said, what did I do? He said, I, I debated, I studied, I did all of these things because I was like trying to get to the next level. I knew I wanted to go to law school and I wanted to go to a great law school. He's like, you played football until you got hurt and then you played beer pop. He's like, that was like who you were, right? He said, I got A's again, right? You couldn't even get a B again. He said, I got a 176 on my LSAT, you got a 159. He said, I went to Yale, you went to Cardozo. He's like, and now here we are both in the summer associate program at Wild Gotcha. That depresses me. And I said, <laughs> I said, well, it's all about when you peak, okay? So for me, it took me a really long time to start peaking. Um, it didn't happen until law school. For him, it started when he came out of the womb. Um, <laughs> but we both ended up in the same place. And I think that's also a really good lesson. It doesn't matter where you came from or what you've done in the past. It matters about what you're going to do today and what you're going to do in the future. Okay. So now here I am as a summer associate at Wild Gotcha. And I'll admit it, I was incredibly intimidated, right? Because I went in there and I'm like, again, right? I never had any, I was very insecure about you know, my intelligence. I never really did well in school until that one year Right, which could have totally been a fluke. Um, and I'm sitting there in, in this wild gotcha all summer class with 70 summer associates from you know, Stanford and Harvard and Yale and NYU and all of these schools. And so when I walked in, I, would, I looked around and said, can I really compete with these people? And, and I don't mean it in a, you know, like a, a sharp elbowed kind of way. I just mean, or is the firm gonna say, well, these people are all really smart and John's not, right? And so it's not gonna work out so well for me. Um, but what I did was, even though I just said you don't work hard, the few assignments I did get, um, I worked really hard on those, right? I made a decision. One of the things that I told myself was that first assignment that I got, I should do really, really well on it because it would stick with me, right? I figured that, you know, if I did a great job on the first assignment, they'd go into the room and they talk about the summer associates and they say, John did great, and then I'd get the benefit of the doubt from then on, even if I ended up not doing so well on something. But if I did badly, then I'd have to be running to catch up all the time. So I worked really, really hard. And then I focused on at least what I think my strengths are. So I got to know the partners. I talked to them, right? I would ask them questions about the work I was doing. When we were having summer associate events, I'd go over and talk to them. Um, you know, some of my strengths with sports, right? They would have like the, the softball, the partner summer associate softball game. Well, I knew that was something that I could do really well at. So I would focus on the strengths. And what I got were a lot of people who started to believe in me because I was doing well and I was getting along with people again. And I know I keep saying this, but stressing it, just you know, saying please and thank you goes a really long way in life. Um, so then I had to figure out what do I want to do, right? It, which is also, I guess, a theme in my life. What do I want to do with my life? And I thought that I wanted to do M&A, okay? Corporate lawyer, mergers and acquisitions. And the reason that I thought that was when I took corporations and I read about all of these um, corporate raiders like T. Boone Pickens and Carl Icahn. I thought that sounded really cool and interesting. So one day I was in the subway going to work. I was reading the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times. And um, I saw there was an article that Westinghouse and CBS were merging. And Wild Gotcha was representing Westinghouse in the merger. So when I got to work, I called the summer associate coordinator and I said, I want to work on this, right? Can I have the opportunity? And she said, sure go see this partner. So I went up to the partner's office. I was all excited. I said, all right, when do we get started? This is going to be so cool, this negotiation, all this. He goes, all right. He said, well, here's what's happening. He said, the business people are over at Cravath right now, okay? And they're, um, they're talking about the business terms. What I need you to do is go look through some old merger documents on these like reps and warranties and pull them out and, and figure out which ones you think are the best. And I said, okay. I said, well, when do we get to do the negotiating part? He's like, oh, well, we don't really do that part. He's like, what we're gonna do is negotiate the documents once the deal's figured out. And I was like, well, that doesn't sound fun, okay? So I did what I had to do, but, um, and then restructurings, right, which is what I do now, 
Um, and, and remind me to go back to one thing, because I think if you, any of you want to be a corporate lawyer and like looking through documents, I think that that's great. It's just not for me, but it is for lots of other people. Um, so now, restructurings, I had a friend who went to Wild Gottschall the year before, and he said, and they, they had a rotating system as a summer associate, so you could rotate through three or four departments. And he said, definitely rotate through restructuring. You won't want to do it, but the people in the group are great. So I said, okay, so I put that on my list, happened to sit on the floor with the restructuring people. Um, and I had another experience where Harvey Miller, who also, it seems like this happened a lot now, but who um, also unfortunately just recently passed away, but was literally the icon in the bankruptcy restructuring world. I mean, he really created modern restructurings. Um, walked by my office one day and said, Hennis, come with me. Right? And first of all, he even spoke to me. I was like, wow, oh my god, this guy's talking to me. So I went running behind him. And Weil was representing Rockefeller Center in a restructuring that was going on. And when we walked in, so we, we go, I follow him, literally following him. He's not waiting for me, so I'm just like walking behind him. I think he dropped a bag for me to pick up, but then we kept going. Um, we got to Rockefeller Center for this meeting, and when he walked in, and it was probably a room like this with this many people, everybody stopped and just wanted to hear what he had to say, right? And, all the, and there were all these people that wanted different things based on you know, the debt that they were holding and where they thought it was trading at and this and that. And I was watching him just like lead this entire situation and I was like, okay, that's for me. That's what I want to do. I don't want to do this like, I don't want to sit and read documents. I don't want to go write lots of briefs. What I want to do is I want to see all this chaos and help bring order to it, right? And I don't know what that says about me, my family life or anything else, but that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be right in the middle of it. So I decided to be a restructuring lawyer. And so I think the lesson here is you all have your own interests, um, your own passions, right? What you're, what you're innately good at. Um, and I think that trying to find that out and then following that is a good thing. Take Val again, okay? Sorry to keep bringing up Val. And I don't know if you guys know Val, but what's your position now, Val? Assistant Dean of Dean of International an international program. program. All right. So what what Val so I've known Val for a long time, right? And and I think you said this word too, but like Val's a dynamo. Val can do anything. There's nothing that Val can't do, okay, for any of you that know her. Um, and so what is Val's talent? Val's talent is she'll work harder than anybody else. She does say please and thank you, and she gets along with everybody. People want to be by her side because she just there's something about her that makes you want to get close to her. And then she, when she has a goal, she goes out and she gets it done. Okay. And so for Val, the job she has right now is perfect because she's out there traveling around, getting more and more LLMs to Cardozo, which is great for Cardozo, um, and that's what she's great at. There's other people that are great at sitting in a room by themselves reading documents and finding things that nobody else can find, okay? That's definitely not me, right? But that may be you, so find your passion, find what right, turns you on, and then follow that. Okay, so turning weaknesses into strength. So two different things, and one of them I already sort of talked about, right? So I'm gonna actually work from the bottom up on this slide. Um, learning to write well, right? So like I said, I really do think right now, with all humility, that I'm a very good writer, okay? And, but I taught myself, right? And the way that I did it was when I sat in that, that meeting with the editor-in-chief of the Law Review and he made it abundantly clear to me that I was a terrible writer, even after I spent hours and hours and hours thinking I was doing a great job, um, what I ended up doing was I said, okay, I need to learn how to write. So how do I do that? And so the way that I did it was I started to imitate other people, right? I didn't go pick up a book on grammar and all that kind of stuff. I started to imitate how other people wrote. So when I became an associate in a law firm, the partner that I worked with first, I would hand in my um, the memo to him and he would literally mark the entire thing up in red. And I had two choices. I could hand it to my assistant and say, can you make these changes? Or I could sit down and make them myself and think about what he was doing and, and try to learn. And that's what I did. So I would sit there and make every one of his changes and I would look at how he wrote. And I got to the point with him where I would hand him memos and he wouldn't make one change to it because I literally wrote exactly like he wrote. Like he used, to, he used a phrase, he would always use a phrase um, in that regard. 
So I would just do that. Like, and, right? and I would just, so he would be like, you're the best writer. And I was like, that's because you think you're the best writer and I'm writing like you now. <laughs> um, but once I got there and I realized that I could write on my own, then I started making writing my own, right? And so I think that that's also a good lesson, that you got to learn the blocking and tackling skills, you got to learn the basics, but once you're good at them, then you can make it yours, right? And you should have the confidence to know that what you have inside is worth, you know, getting out into the world, so you should be doing that. And then public speaking. So Dean Macchiarola again, when he, um, my third year of law school, he, um, he um, re didn't retire, he was moving on to something new. And they were having a ceremony for him. And so he asked about four or five people to speak. Um, and he asked me if I would say some words about him. So I was very flattered by that. Um, and I wrote a very small little, I wouldn't even call it a speech, but I, I wrote a few words. Um, and I was sitting kind of waiting in line to go up, you know, to some place like this to go talk to a bunch of people, probably less people actually than are in here now. And as people started going up and talking, my heart started beating really fast. And then my throat started to feel like it was gonna close. And then I was having trouble breathing. And then I was sitting there being like, wow, is it really, am I having a heart attack? What's going on? There's something going on right now. And, but I finally, it was my turn, and I kind of ran up, and I looked straight at Dean Macchiarola, and I said my speech as fast as I've ever said anything in my entire life, and then I walked away. And I actually felt really badly about it. I felt badly for him, because I felt like I didn't do a good job for him, but I also felt badly that I, I felt like that. And so I said, I don't ever want to feel like that again, so I have two choices. I can never speak in public again, right? Or I can find a way to get myself comfortable with it. And I decided to get myself comfortable with it. And so there's not a chance that I would have been able to be up here. You know, when I was in law school, thinking that I could be up here, standing here and talking like this, it would have been impossible. I would have told you I could never do it. Um, but I think it's also a lesson that if you put your mind to something and you work at it and you work hard, you can end up, I don't know if I'm speaking well, but at least I'm speaking comfortably. Okay. All right, so be in the arena. Um, and we're kind of getting towards the end. So one of the other things that I've found in life is, is go do the things that interest you. Don't be afraid. It goes kind of to my grandfather's you know, advice of if you want to run a movie, movie studio, run a movie studio. Um, I got to the point, so I, I was doing TV for a while, um, and not, not like getting paid for TV, but just going on TV when there were issues about bankruptcies, restructurings, um, whether it was corporate or, um, or sovereign type things. And the way that this came about was I knew the guy who ran CNBC, and he called me up one day and he said, and this is when the whole financial crisis happened, and he said, have you ever been on TV before? And I said, no. And he said, well, we need somebody to talk about um, certain issues. And, you know, you seem like when we talk, you always talk well, so can you come do it? And I actually, that day, I couldn't do it. Um, and so he called back and he said, can you come on? And I was like, sure, I'll try that. And I did it, and then I started getting invited back. And it was, you know, CNBC, CNN, Bloomberg, everybody was calling me and saying, you know, come on TV. Now, I've, I've, I've for a lot of reasons, I've slowed that down, but it was something that, I always had an interest in doing. I never thought I would be able to do. The opportunity came up, and so I took it. Um, and you should definitely do that. So if there's things in life that you're right now sitting there saying, I'd love to do this, but I don't think I can, or why could somebody like me do it? Well, just take a lesson from me. Any, if I can do it, anybody can do it. So take those chances. Get yourself in the arena. You know, Don't worry about failing, because failing actually at the end of the day is a good thing. It's what teaches you the most. But just get in there and do it. Um, I did other things too. When I was at Weill, just so you get it, and I'll do this very briefly, I was at Weill for about three and a half years and then left and tried to start my own business, right? It was during the whole dot-com craze and so with a couple people that I knew, we tried to start this software business and based on a lot of things, including I had no idea what it meant to start a business um, and because the NASDAQ ended up crashing, it didn't work out, but I did it for about a year and a half and it was such an amazing experience because I had to do things I had never done before. I had to build a team, I had to build a board, I had to raise money, I had to fire people when we ran out of money. I had to deal with you know, the true sense of failure, right? That here I was like trying to do something and trying to do something that I thought was great and then it all came crashing down on me, right? And then you have to come back from that and figure out how best to come back from that. So there's a million lessons in putting yourself out there and trying something. 
And then after that, um, and that company was called Blaze Ventures, I went to Kirkland. And I got lucky, right? And sometimes in life you get lucky and take advantage of it when you do. And I got lucky because with the NASDAQ crashing, which crushed my company, um, it also gave me an opportunity, which was we were in the middle of a recession and every big law firm needed um, bankruptcy people and there weren't a lot of them out there. So I had my pick of firms and I had my pick of lot. Like they were giving me signing bonuses. They were ready to bump me up a year. There were firms that were like, we'll make you a partner now. I'm thinking to myself, I practiced law for three and a half years and like, I'm getting all these opportunities. But, and then I decided on Kirkland and Ellis. And for me, the reason I decided on Kirkland was because the pitch that I got from the main partner, Jamie Sprayring, and who still runs um, Kirkland Analysis Restructuring Practice today, and he is the guy in restructurings, he said to me, we're different from other firms. We're entrepreneurial. We let our um, associates and partners go run with things and take chances, and it's up to you. If you fail, you know, you're going to fail, but if you do great, you can really do great things here. And I loved what he was telling me, so I jumped in thinking, I'm going to do this for a year and then go back to business because I hate being a lawyer. And now it's 16 years later and I'm still there. Um, but everything he told me was true. Um, and I took advantage of that opportunity. All right. I'm skipping this slide, if that's OK. All right, last thing I want to talk about. So just to summarize, um, really, if I can be standing up here talking up to all of you, and have accomplished the things that I have, it really does mean anybody can. Because if, when, when, um, when Dean Leslie was talking about, um, you know, kind of all the things, at least on my bio, that I've accomplished, and again, remembering it's all marketing, um, if you had said to anyone that I went to high school with, any of my teachers, um, anybody I went to college with, any of my professors, um, or my parents, and said, Okay, here's a list of all of these things that somebody's going to accomplish, you know, 20 years from now, right? Name the five people from John's graduating class in high school or at Union. Um, who would it be? I would never have been on that list. I wouldn't even have been close to that list. If they had made it 10 people, I wouldn't have been on that list, okay? But you can do anything so long as you focus at it, work hard, don't let failure stop you. Um, and if you do that, you can really, I mean, I, I feel incredibly fortunate because I've had a very full um, career that's been incredibly satisfying to me. Um, and now I want to get into what to me is the most important thing. And it's also given me an opportunity, and I said give forward, and I said in the beginning of this talk, I don't always like the word, the phrase give back, and here's why. I feel like when you say you're giving back, it's like you know, there was like a quid pro quo, right? Somebody did something for me, so now I'm going to do something for that person. Um, when I look at charity, I look at it as giving forward. I want to, if I'm going to do something, I want to do something so then the person that's getting the benefit of that will go do something for somebody else and it'll just continue to move forward. Um, and I've had an incredible opportunity to get involved in a lot of charities. And I want to talk about one just because it's kind of near and dear to my heart right now um, because I just got back from Honduras and we talked about this Honduras trip. And I think the story is worth telling. Okay. So um, last story, I promise, and then I'll stop and open up the questions. So um, here I am at Kirkland and Ellis, and there's a, uh, a man named Ramiro, Ramiro Ocasio. And Ramiro, at the time, <clears throat> he's still at Kirkland, worked in the mailroom. Okay? And Ramiro is the type of guy who he would deliver mail, and he would stop into your office, and he would talk about sports or politics or life. And everybody looked forward to that visit from Ramiro because he is this, it may, he, he reminds me actually a lot of Val. Like, he's like that person that you want to just be around, right? Because he, he, makes you, he makes you feel better about yourself and about the world. And one day he comes into my office, it's right around um, the Christmas, the holidays, and New Year, and he says, um, he says, John, what are you doing for the holidays? So I told him what I was doing. I said, what are you doing? And he said, well, every year, he said, I grew up in Honduras. And every year, my friends and I go back down to Honduras, and we go to a poor village, and we bring supplies and food and water and presents for the kids. Right? And that's what I'm doing. And, I, and he left. And I sat, sat there and thought about it. I said, OK, here's this guy who works in the mailroom. Right? So it doesn't make a lot of money. He's taking his savings to go buy a plane ticket to fly back down to Honduras to buy food and supplies and presents for kids and to go to a poor village to give them out. And why? 
because he wants to do something good for other people that don't have as much as he even has. Um, so when he walked out, I wrote a small check and I emailed him and I said, I left you something, use it for whatever you want. So he goes down, he comes back, it's after the holidays and he goes, um, he was like, I, got, I thank you so much. He's like, you have no idea how far, right? It was $500, how far $500 goes down there. He goes, you can feed a family forever. He goes, you're famous down there now. Your name's been all over the news. Here's a plaque from the Honduran Congress thanking you, right? And I'm not kidding, right? And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, like, well, what did, I didn't do anything. Like, what did I have wrote a check for $500. But he explained all of this to me. Now jump ahead a year. He walks back into my office. Hey, I'm going back down. I'm like, you couldn't give me more notice? So I run around, right, talk to a bunch of partners, and we raise $3,000 for him. We send him down. He, he goes down, he uses it. Next year, again, last minute, he comes back to me and he says, I'm doing something different this year. This year, we're going down to fix up a school. I said, great, ran around again. We raised $9,000 for him. He went down, comes back with a video of the whole community fixing up the school, painting it, doing all these things. Six months after that, he gets a call from the principal of the school who says, for the first time ever, um, not one kid dropped out this year, right? So I said, all right, stop. We got we to gotta, we gotta stop. We got to call a timeout. No more of this ad hoc stuff. I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to start a foundation. I'm going to get Kirkland and Ellis to do all the pro bono work to set up the foundation. You, Ramiro, are going to be the president of this foundation. We're going to go down to Honduras, and we're going to build schools. I'll help you get a board together, right, and we'll start raising money. And he looked at me like I was crazy. He was like, who am I? I'm Ramiro Ocasio from Honduras. Like, yeah, I'm gonna be the president of a foundation. And I said, you are, okay? And so he, so he started talking about it a little. And again, um, Ramiro is this amazing guy who somehow everybody just wants to be around. So before we even started to raise money, before we even had everything in place, partners, associates, support staff from Kirkland started writing checks. And to build a school down in Honduras, depending on how big and everything you're gonna do, it's like twenty, thirty thousand dollars. So we're not talking about a lot of money that you have to raise. So we ended up Ramiro and a team that's down in Honduras went and found a school down there. And the school, um, it was two classrooms for kids in first through sixth grade. Um, the classrooms had dirt floors, no desks, no blackboards. Um, if they had a textbook, they were lucky. The roof has holes in it, so when it rain or had holes in it, so when it rains, the kids can't go to school. Um, the bathroom, one, the one bathroom was um, so disgusting the boys wouldn't even use it, so girls wouldn't even go to school. Um, and they, you know, they would go in bare feet and everything else. So we decided that was the place that we were going to go do our first school. And I went down two weekends ago for our ribbon cutting, um, and what we ended up building and and. Truthfully, this is Ramiro and the team in Honduras, but we built six new classrooms, right, with non-dirt non floors, concrete floors, um, desks for all the kids, blackboards, textbooks, um, six new bathrooms, filtered water so they can drink and wash their hands with it. Um, we got them backpacks with full school supplies. Um, we got them uh, new shoes that were made by like, local artisans down there. Um, and we got them um, new school uniforms. Um, and in addition, and their favorite thing, um, we got them a playground, which you've never seen people so happy to have a playground, right? And I can just tell you right now, American kids, you stick them on a playground, they fight, they call for their parents. These kids were on this playground helping each other, waiting in line. It was really an amazing, amazing thing to watch. Um, but that, that's the type of thing that I think at the end of the day, your goal should be, and then I'm going to give one last story around this, um, which is why do we do all the things that we do, right? Some of it is because we're passionate about it. We want to be successful, right? Maybe, maybe some of your goal is I want to earn a lot of money and live a nice life. But if you can't give forward at the end of the day, right, it really isn't worth it. Okay. Last thing I'm going to say, and it's right around this. Um, and, and this is not a patting myself on the back, but it was like one of those moments that came up and, um, and I think that you guys should all think about this. So when I was growing up and before I got to the point where I could write checks that institutions would care about and then say things to me like, oh, be on my board because we want you to raise money, um, I always used to get frustrated because I couldn't get involved. And so Ramiro, again, is on a plane. He's getting on a plane to go to Chicago to visit his mom. It's snowing. The plane gets canceled. The flight gets canceled. 
there's this guy standing next to him. They're both complaining about how the flight got canceled. As um, the guy walks away, the person up front says to Ramiro, we actually have two seats on this next flight that's going out if you and your friend want them, right? Now, this wasn't his friend. It was just some guy. He goes, he chases down the guy. They go, they sit in the back of the plane together. The guy works at Morgan Stanley, speaks Spanish, so wants to practice his Spanish with Ramiro. Ramiro tells him the whole story about Faye. Ramiro gets back, right, and comes running into my office. Everything happens with him running into my office. And he's like, he's like, I met this guy from Morgan Stanley. This is huge, okay? Like, this is gonna be great. We can get like Morgan Stanley behind us. I mean, this guy is awesome. He's already doing PowerPoint presentations and this and this. And I'm like, who, okay, who is this guy? He's like, it's Jordan. I was like, okay. So he's like, and I want you to meet him. I said, fantastic. So I sit down, right, and go meet Jordan with Ramiro for a drink. And um, it turns out that Jordan just graduated from Michigan, right? So he's not writing checks for us. Um, he's, you know, 22 years old. So Jordan says to me, oh, my God, it's so great to meet you. And what you guys are doing is great. Anything I can do, I'd love to get involved. And I said, all right, well, you know what you can do? I said, you can be the president of our junior committee. And he said, well, what junior committee? And I said, that's up to you. Go build a junior committee. And so he's now built this junior committee with about 20 people on it focused on all sorts of things. We have like a healthcare team, a marketing team, a PR team, and he's done all of this. And watching the enthusiasm of this junior committee, and truthfully, Faye would be nowhere without it. Um, I mean, they do more than the board does. It was amazing. And so look for those types of opportunities, right? And look for people that will give you those opportunities because I can just tell you it's so, so meaningful. All right, so with that, um, I hope today was helpful in some ways. I hope I said at least one thing that you might think about it might help you in the future. Um, and I want to thank you for having me. And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them right from here, or you can ask me afterwards. Um, so anyway, thank you guys.